Okay, I think we will, uh, we're ready to start. Um, I will introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Richard Linehan. Uh, Dr. Richard Linehan, Rick, is, uh, is, his official job title is NASA astronaut. I think there are very, very many exciting titles he holds, which will be another talk, I guess. And I think NASA astronauts don't um, require much explanation. Uh, this is his object of the day. So he's uh, brought this, uh, share with us this photo as his center point for discussion today. Um, but I would highlight his connection to medicine here uh, as an introduction. He has obtained his first degree in animal sciences with a minor in microbiology and then veterinary medicine and become a chief clinical veterinarian for the UK, US uh, Navy's Marine Mammal Program in 1989. In 1992, he was selected by NASA. Since then, he has performed many experiments related to life science studies. Um, I will hand over to Rick so that he can tell you all about these experiences and his uh, experiences in using spacesuit and sort of how that feels um, when, when one is inside such a technical object. Um, uh, over to you, Rick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Rick, live from Houston, about a six hour time delay for everybody in, uh, in London. Um, I wanted to talk this morning a bit about spacesuits, uh, the history, my history, my personal history, and what it's like to do an EVA. All right, so since this, uh, since this conference, online, WebEx, uh, whatever we'll call it, is, is about uh, doing spacewalks or EVAs, um, as an astronaut, I've given talks over the years. I've been at NASA since 1992. And uh, I always get the question about what it's like to be in a spacesuit and do a spacewalk. Is it is it fun? Yeah, it's fun. Is it a lot of work? Yes, it's it's a lot of work. Is it a lot of exercise? Is it tiring? It's all of those, but it's also an incredible experience. And um, I don't want to like bring people down to the uh, elementary school level, but uh, usually I spend a lot of time there. And when kids and people ask me what it's like to do a spacewalk, I tell everyone to picture themselves in a suit of medieval armor. You know, those classic suits uh, that, uh, you know, like uh, it's perfect over in London, Henry VIII and, and the, uh, uh, the classic museums. Uh, but imagine you're in a suit of medieval armor and you're on roller skates and you've got a giant fishbowl over your head and you're wearing boxing gloves and you have a pair of lobster. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll get her. She goes a little nuts when she sees uh, squirrels out the window. So we'll have to get her quieted down. But um, so imagine that um, you're wearing uh, boxing gloves and have a pair of lobster tongs and you're told to go out and change the spark plugs in your car in the dark. And that gives you a pretty good idea of what it's like to be in a spacesuit. Um, the suits that we have definitely don't augment our abilities. Uh, ideally, in a, a sci-fi world, we'd be in these super suits that make us superhuman. We can do all this and, and get everything done faster. We're stronger. We're more, um, you know, tactile. But that's not the case in, in our suits. So um, you really have to learn how to work inside one of these suits. And it takes a lot of training uh, and a lot of patience to do that. So uh, I'll stop there if anyone has any questions, but I can go on and talk about training and my missions that I did EVAs on. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so the history, and uh, we have a gentleman this morning from ILC who is a spacesuit guru. He'll talk more about that after me, who knows the ins and outs of the workings of the systems, the engineering, uh, the effort put in to make these spacesuits. But historically uh, for the US, um, the first spacesuits for astronauts were made for the, uh, for the uh, Mercury program. And then we followed that on uh, with, a, with the Gemini program. 
uh, into Apollo. And Gemini was uh, one of the first space, the first space walk, so to speak, where we left the capsule. And then the Apollo suits, the classic uh, Apollo suits or moon suits, were actually built uh, with boots that were made for rocky, uh, rocky landscapes. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, they could walk on the moon, which is different from doing a so-called spacewalk, right? I mean, we call uh, uh, the moonwalk versus a spacewalk working in a, in a somewhat uh, less than Earth G environment to a zero G environment in space. So the suits are a bit different. Uh, the zero G suit that's uh, been around uh, since before the shuttle program actually is kind of a hybrid evolution of all the suits that came before it uh, from the Apollo suit on. And uh, we use that on the space shuttle, and it's made to work uh, in a zero G environment, i.e., we're floating in space. Uh, so we have boots, but the boots aren't made for walking, uh, as it says that old Nancy Sinatra song goes. They're made for floating, and uh, the suit itself probably weighs in around 300 pounds or so, and uh, it's something that you would not want to try to move in uh, on the Earth or in a one G environment. Uh, because uh, you literally would fall over, land on your back, and you'd be like a turtle. Pretty, pretty unlikely you'd be able to right yourself or even stand up because of the weight and the balance of the suit. Um, how do you get used to, how do you sort of work in this environment uh, when you cannot really walk around on Earth? What were the sort of tips and tricks mm -hmm. you used to understand how that technological object, the spacesuit, uh, could help you to work in the operating environment, which is the real space environment? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, people also ask, it's like, well, where do you, where do you train on the planet? Do you have a zero G room on, 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 you know, on earth someplace. And we don't, right. We, we'd love to be able to figure out how gravity works and reverse the effects and make it, make a zero G room. But what we do have is a big pool called the neutral buoyancy lab. And that's uh, in Houston uh, at Johnson space center. And we train in that underwater in a neutrally buoyant environment. So we'll take suits just like we do, uh, we wear in space, downgraded suits that can be immersed in water. And we'll get in those suits and we'll go down in water. And in this case, when we're in the water in the suit, we'll be in umbilicals. Uh, so we'll have air, water, cooling, calm, all that stuff supplied through umbilicals to us where we work underwater. And we'll perform the same EVAs that we're planning on doing in space underwater. And we'll practice and practice and practice. And for instance, um, my first EVAs were on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and as a good rule of thumb, back then when we trained, we spent about 12 hours underwater in our suits for every hour we sent, spent in space doing the real EVAs. So we trained, 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 sometimes uh, four times a week uh, in the suits underwater in the nuclear buoyancy lab. And it's a lot of work. so. Um, <laughs> it's like going to the gym and lifting weights uh, too much for four or five days in a row. You can be really tired, really sore. So you have to pace yourself for training on the ground because believe it or not, uh, when you're in the water, it's actually harder than it is to do the real EVA um, because you're fighting water viscosity. You're floating in a, a neutrally buoyant in a water column, but you still weigh what you weigh. So the suit, with all its weight packs and everything underwater is probably 350 pounds or more. And uh, you're in that suit and you have to move it, ride it, go upside down, make it move, bend arms against pressure. And it's a lot of work. Uh, so for that reason, we also train in the gym. We try to stay as fit and as strong as possible. So when we do the real EVAs, everything goes the way we planned. Thank you, Rick. Um, and uh, maybe just sort of, it would be interesting to hear like a surprising story, a very sort of unusual insights from your experience uh, in, in being in a spacesuit, operating a spacesuit. I have a few of those. Um, but, um, you know, the first time you go out the door, you wonder what it's going to be like. And, uh, you know, it's like the, the classic pinch myself, you know, I'm here, but you can't pinch yourself in a spacesuit. So you're just kind of floating around in awe. And really, when you're in a spacesuit, you're in your own little spaceship, right? Because you're separated from the shuttle, 
Uh, and the only thing that holds you there are the tethers, your tethers. And, you know, for the mountain climbers and rock climbers out there, you'll understand this better than most. But uh, whenever you climb uh, or do a spacewalk, you're always tethered everywhere you go. So you'll be placing tethers like on a rock face or climbing wall wherever you move. And you'll be watching your tethers and you'll be watching your buddy's tether because when you do spacewalks, you're always out in pairs. Uh, never go out by yourself because if something happens and you need help, you have your buddy to rely on. So you're always kind of like uh, you're the wingman and they're the, your wingman, but you're always watching the other person, their tether and vice versa to make sure when you move around, uh, if it's Hubble or the space station or the shuttle, uh, that you don't entangle yourselves mm -hmm. and that you stay safe. Uh, now, a story that I, I have many stories. Um, I'll, I'll give you one story, which uh, was a surprising story, which kind of opened my eyes. Um, you know, when you're out in the suit, uh, you just, you know, you're there, you're doing your job and you tend to start thinking, well, this is, you know, this is not, not a bad thing. It's I'm safe. I'm, I'm fine. Everything's working. As long as the suit goes the way it needs to and everything runs, everything's going to be fine. Well, on one of my uh, EVAs to the space station uh, at the last, maybe within the last hour, they asked me to go get a specific piece of hardware, which is stored up high on the space station uh, between the Russian and U.S. segments on a big thing called a mast, which sticks straight out uh, up zenith on the station and you literally have to climb up it it's a stanchion and at the top of that uh, you go through this thing called the rat's nest uh, and they call it that because there's all kinds of cables and all kinds of things you can get um, tangled up on so you have to be very careful but at the top of that mast uh, is a, a toolbox where we store tools that can be uh, left outside and used uh, as needed on space station EVAs. And I went up to that, I finally get up to the box and it was dark most of the time we were on a night pass. By the way, everyone, when you fly in space, every 45 minutes it's light and every 45 minutes it's dark. And so you need to deal with that in your spacesuit because everything can be pitch black. And then when the sun comes up, everything can be so bright you can't even look at it, which is why you see those classic pictures of people uh, with their uh, silver or gold shades down on their face because the sun gets so bright that if you look at it, uh, you could actually burn out your retinas. So you need protection from uh, the sunlight, uh, the candle power, and the ultraviolet uh, radiation. Um, but to get back to the story, I got to the top of the mast and opened up the toolbox. And when I got there, I tethered myself. And I remember uh, opening up the toolbox. And when I got there, it takes a while to get everything uh, set up and tethered. And so I was there probably for 15, 10, 15 minutes getting ready and tethered. And I remember looking at the toolbox and it's this big white uh, thing that looks like a refrigerator. Uh, and it was pretty nondescript, just a big white face. And uh, I had to go and uh, move around and do a few things and come back and pick up some tethers and some other things. And when I got back up there, uh, I noticed uh, that, uh, you know, there was this blade look on the outside of the toolbox, and I, I didn't think much of it. I go, I didn't remember that, but uh, it's interesting. It looks like... Uh, uh, break each other's configurations. We're not it going looks to like uh, the classic, uh, if you can remember the classic Japanese flag design of the setting sun with the rays. Uh, on the white background, it looked like that, like a center with rays, emanating rays. But I opened up the toolbox and took this tool out that they needed, put it on my workstation, closed the toolbox up, and then made my way back down into the airlock, which probably took me another half an hour or so, and finished off the EVA, came in, and uh, as we were getting unsuited in the airlock, we were removing all the tools from our mini workstations, and uh, I took my tools off and put them to the side in a rack. And then after I got off, I was doing inventory. Um, and I took the tool off uh, that I had retrieved. It was called a scoop, which is a big chunk of metal uh, that's used to attach to giant ORUs or equipment. So you can hold on to it and put it on ball stacks and things and carry them around. But at any rate, 
I took this giant chunk of metal, uh, you know, and I'm talking maybe it's about a foot long and about uh, maybe two inches thick with a big cone on the end. And I looked at it and there was a big hole in the middle of it and with molten metal all through the hole. And it looked like someone had taken a, a 30 odd six rifle bullet and shot a hole through this huge chunk of metal, which you can imagine takes a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of penetration. And what had happened was, and we don't know when, uh, hopefully it wasn't while I was up there, but what had happened was a micrometeorite had actually gone through the toolbox, uh, put that big splay design on the outside of the box and actually gone right through the tool itself and melted it. So you can imagine uh, that, you know, that was surprising. And that kind of brings you back to reality thinking, I'm glad I wasn't, <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't in the way of that micrometeorite because it would go through you just like it went through the metal. So uh, it brings the reality of space travel and space flight a little closer to you and that, that it's dangerous. Uh, and there are things out there that uh, regardless of their size that are moving so fast, even if there's hardly any mass in them, it can cause a lot of damage to equipment and people. So that's one thing you have to worry about when you're out doing a spacewalk. Um, highly unlikely, it's never happened. Highly unlikely it will, but that's why the spacesuit is designed the way it is. And uh, Dan from ILC will talk about that more, I'm sure, but there are multi-layers to the suit. Uh, they won't stop a micrometeorite, but they're designed to keep heat in, uh, keep you safe uh, from radiation, uh, thermal loss, all that good stuff. It's a, it's an amazing design. I think it's like 14 layers thick, something like that on the, on the, on the spacesuit. So that's one story. I'm going to stop talking now if anyone has any questions and uh, I can also tell you some more uh, later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick. That's like perfect timing. Um, I think you've left a very good entrance for Dan to, to join and uh, talk about how to support a spacesuit. In fact, we also have a question from the audience around uh, how do you deal with suit malfunction? So I think this is probably something that Dan would come in and, uh, and support uh, or give, share some ideas on that. Um, so with this, I'm going to introduce our next uh, panelist, Dan. Um, Dan is uh, can I can I have Dan slide, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so Dan is uh, from ILC Dover. As Rick has already pointed out, uh, ILC Dover basically makes the spacesuit, makes the EMU spacesuit that you see commonly in spacewalk photos all the time. And that's what a lot of astronauts uh, wear in the International Space Station and also outside. Uh, sorry, only outside. You only wear that to go outside. Um, as, well as, ILC, as well as spacesuit, ILC Dover also makes uh, PPEs. And Dan is helping ILC Dover to prepare for future human space exploration in low Earth orbit and beyond, as well as helping to improve the protection of healthcare uh, workers and other working in hazardous environments and here on Earth. Uh, over to you, Dan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Stephanie said, uh, I work for ILC Dover, and uh, ILC Dover is uh, perhaps uniquely positioned in the entire world in being um, likely the only company that produces both spacesuits and PPE equipment. We uh, participate in one of our divisions in the respiratory PPE area, uh, but for the purposes of this morning's talk, I'll talk about um, about our participation um, with spacesuits. Um, we've designed and built every EBA spacesuit for NASA since the Apollo era. So we're the only company in the world that's protected a human on the surface of the moon. Um, and uh, we still are uh, designing and uh, building um, advanced spacesuits for the upcoming Artemis missions. So uh, we have a, a long history in this era um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about how, um, how the spacesuits have evolved over the years. So back in the Apollo era, um, the spacesuits were, um, were designed for and custom tailored for each individual astronaut. Um, so the, uh, all the astronauts that, uh, that walked on the moon had a suit that was dedicated to them, actually several, because they had a training suit uh, as well as uh, 
as well as the primary suit. So, um, uh, and those suits were custom tailored to that individual astronaut. Uh, that's evolved to today where the suits are the current EMU suit and going into the future, the, the next generation suits are all modular. Um, they have various pieces that can be assembled um, with, um, with other pieces to make a more or less custom fit, but out of, a, um, out of an array of more standardized parts. So we've been able to reduce the cost of the suits by doing that, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as reduce or in uh, increase the lifetime of, uh, um, of each individual uh, piece of the suit. So today's suits, the EMU suits, consist of an upper torso, arms, gloves, uh, and a couple of pieces on the lower torso as well. And as Rick alluded to, um, today's suits um, are not what we call walk-around suits. So they're not meant for one-sixth or uh, hopefully someday one-third um, G. They're uh, where you'll be walking on the, the surface of the moon or, uh, or Mars. Um, Today's suits are designed for what we call space walks, but they're really space floats is a, is a better way of describing it. So they don't need much mobility in the lower torso. Uh, they don't need hard boots because you're not walking on any kind of rocky surface. You're just uh, floating um, in orbit. And, uh, and so, um, so it, it's possible for us to, uh, to make suits that uh, can be reconfigured for different astronauts. And so they go through a certain life cycle where, um, where for a specific astronaut coming through the program, we'll configure the suit out of our various pieces. Um, and the most customized piece, by the way, are the gloves. Uh, we currently have, uh, last time I looked, 63 different sizes of gloves. Um, if an astronaut is coming through the program and starting their training and they try on those, uh, those gloves and can't find one that will be a, a perfect fit, we'll make, we'll make a new size. Of glove, but because of the dexterity required, and as Rick alluded to, they're a bit like boxing gloves. I mean, they're um, they have many many layers to them to protect against all the the the, um, the things that you see in space. Um, so they're they're very thick, and they need to be by their very um, very nature of the um, of their purpose. Um, they also need to provide some degree of dexterity. And so they're, um, they tend to be, uh, the, the, or they are, the most difficult part of the suit to, uh, to design and manufacture. Um, but uh, to get back to uh, sort of the life cycle of an EMU, so it gets reconfigured for multiple astronauts. And then after it's, um, the various components have, um, have sort of exceeded their or uh, reached their, um, wow. their specified uh, lifetime for use in space, they get repurposed for use in the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. So a lot of the components that are in a suit um, that's uh, being used for training in this Neutral Buoyancy Lab, um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, go online and Google Neutral Buoyancy Lab. It is the most spectacular thing. It's a giant indoor swimming pool, um, and they have uh, a portion of the uh, a replica of the International Space Station uh, submerged in the pool. Um, it's really pretty spectacular the first time you see it uh, live. But um, the um, anyway, the suits that uh, that are being used in the neutral buoyancy lab are uh, many of those components have actually already been to space and have been uh, repurposed then for uh, for training exercises. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the uh, the effort that it takes to support uh, an astronaut during an EVA or a pair of astronauts, as Rick alluded to, uh, they always go out in pairs um, during uh, today's EVAs from the International Space Station. Um, one of the things that, uh, that is surprising to many people is that, uh, um, that two of our engineers at ILC Dover are, uh, are on a continuous open phone line with mission control at the Johnson Space Center during every EVA. And there are, and that, that goes from um, donning the suit and the pre-breathe all the way through coming back through the airlock and starting to uh, doff the suit. Um, so um, uh, our engineers typically spend about 12 continuous hours on the phone. And again, we have two of them, one per astronaut um, that are dedicated during that 12 hour period um, 
which, I, as I said, includes the donning of the suit, the pre-breathe period, and then going out through the airlock, doing the spacewalk, which typically their um, astronauts are outside for about uh, six to eight hours is a typical spacewalk today, um, and then coming back through the airlock and, um, and starting to uh, take the suit off, uh, or doffing the suit, as, uh, as we say. Um, and so that uh, there's a lot of support that goes on behind that's uh, behind the scenes that uh, not many people are aware of. Um, so that's uh, kind of a, an interesting little tidbit of uh, of how the support goes. Um, Rick talked about micrometeoroids and one of them penetrating his toolbox. Um, well, the periodically the space station itself takes micrometeoroid uh, impacts. And those gold-colored handles that are on the outside that they use to traverse, um, to move themselves around, to get to the uh, the area that uh, um, that's in need of repair or where, where their mission is on that particular spacewalk, um, those can take micrometeoroid impacts. And it forms like if you look under a uh, magnifying glass, it forms like a little sharp-edged crater um, on those handles. And one of the things that we routinely do is have the astronauts do um, routine periodic glove checks because they're using their gloves to traverse. And those micrometeoroid impacts can leave really sharp edges. And we put a lot of uh, anti-abrasion um, type materials on the palms of the, 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 uh, the gloves. But still, we were worried about, uh, about um, a, a small tear in those. Um, so we have the, the astronauts routinely do a glove check where they hold their gloves up uh, in front of their helmet cams so we can take a good look at the palm of the glove um, sort of one at a time because they're typically holding on with one of their hands and then they have one of their hands in front of their helmet cam so we can see the palm of the glove. And we do that about once an hour during a, uh, during a typical EVA. So another little thing that... Uh, um, that's kind of a, a behind the scenes little tidbit about uh, what goes on during uh, um, uh, during EVAs. I mean, the Hollywood version of this, uh, um, since I've become immersed in, uh, in spacesuits and spacesuit technology, um, and I see Rick smiling there, um, the Hollywood version is uh, far, far away from the reality of, uh, of what it takes to keep somebody safe and not uh, in space. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's perfect. Um, and so I think we will um, now uh, bring Julia in and hear her perspective. Um, and then we'll have a discussion all together, picking up on a lot of the questions. I think I see questions are coming in already. Um, keep them coming. Uh, we, will, we will pick them up uh, later on. And so Julia, Julia Duncan has been in the industry of providing clean air solutions for just shy of eight years. She's quite an entrepreneurial spirit, actually. Um, I asked her how she got into being a technical sales for Clean Air Solutions. And she told me when she was waitressing, she got asked if she'd sell clean air. And yes, she said, and here she is. Um, so uh, Julia has been brought in because the clean air solution is really focused on the environment and PPE when you're donning and duffing them, there's a whole process around it. And I guess Julia is going to tell us a little bit more about this whole process and how to keep a, a, the a operating environment clean as well as just uh, the suit clean. So um, I will hand over to Julia now. I think, uh, yeah, over to, over to you, Julia. Thank you, Steph. I'm uh, just going to share my screen so we can get a, a better understanding um, of some images regarding uh, the Clean Air Solution. So if you can uh, just uh, let me know if the screen has been shared. Uh, not yet. Oh, here we are. I think it's, uh, it's just come up now. Said so you've started sharing the screen. Okay, so is it up? Yeah, it's up. Okay, great. So uh, as you mentioned, it, it was a bit of a, a, a fortuitous way of, of coming into the industry. And uh, with it, there've been incredible experiences with regards to, to clean rooms. And with Mama Scientific, we work with a, a broad range of, of clients, you know, within the aeronautical, uh, um, pharmaceutical, mobile, uh, universities uh, such as Hamlin, as you'll see later, um, healthcare and, and Ministry of Defe 
sense because the fundamentals of a clean room is really about the airflow and, and contamination and the particle size and, and mitigating uh, those particles entering the clean room and, and affecting whatever is being done within them. Uh, you know, the smallest sort of particle can really cause a, a lot of damage depending on, on what you're doing. So just as a sort of entry level clean room, the, uh, the modular clean room was designed and that sort of satisfies a higher end of, of clean room. So your, your clean room classification is, is to an ISO standard. I mean, it's 14644. And depending on uh, the airflow that you require, for example, a unidirectional flow um, that's done within, within hospital operating theatres, that's sort of an ISO 5. And then a, a more dispersed airflow will go towards your ISO 7, ISO 8 classification. So typically, a room uh, such as the modular clean room can, can achieve up to an ISO 6. And it really is, uh, it's not, they're built within, within uh, uh, buildings. They're not fit for purpose buildings. So it's moving a small volume of air uh, from the room in which it is installed. That air then travels through the clean air modules that are supported by the ceiling um, and goes through HEPA filters, bringing a positive pressure of clean air, sort of 99.997% clean air based on 0.3 of a micron. Um, so that's the, the HEPA filters have the capabilities of trapping 0.3 of a, mark, a micron. And as uh, Dan spoke about the, you know, he mentioned that the donning and doffing of the spacesuit within the airlock. Uh, if you look here, we've got the uh, changing atrium where once you walk in, the journey sort of starts sometimes, uh, you know, at the fence of, of a clean room establishment where Private prior approval that has been given. In some cases, you've signed an NDA, and there's certain processes and procedures with, with particular uh, protocols in place, depending on your level of clean room. So for example, if you are going to a clean room where they are, are doing um, that, the, the modules that get launched from Earth, uh, they speak about the the engineers working on them having a PPE up to their undergarments. You know, everything is is so controlled, and, and the contamination process of the airflow. So as soon as you go into the clean room, you you can see there's a step over bench, and and, and once you've stepped over that bench, that's a new level of, of cleanliness um, and of airflow. And the process itself is quite long. And I think it's important that the users understand uh, the mechanics of, of a clean room and, and what it, it takes with the airflow. And they take that into consideration, you know, making sure that you're hydrated and you, you don't have to leave and you don't have to have to disrupt the processes being done within the clean room. Uh, and that helps you to, to mitigate contamination or, or cross contamination of particles still coming through. Um, for, for, for objects that don't necessarily require to be, to be taken in, we've got the uh, transfer hatch, which you put something on the dirty side of the room, go into the clean room and opening it. And once again, depending on the level of your clean room, that, uh, that transfer hatch may even have its own airflow. And um, so, so once you've sort of gone into the clean room and um, you've gone through the, the, the donning process and you inside, it's important that the clean room satisfies uh, the requirements. So for uh, the Hamlin Robotics Center, we were asked to install a clean room, eight by four meters that would guarantee a, a clean air classification. With the, the modular clean rooms, it really offers versatility in terms of being able to be reused. Um, you can expand it at, the, at a later stage. The extrusions provide separations and bespoke models. So we, we did a bespoke of, of UV protection on, on the, the, uh, the panels, the, the viewing panels, as well as the lighting um, for, for the clean room where you, you do all your medical robotics and, and making sure that the particles are not there. Um, because those can, as I mentioned, can be pretty detrimental. You know, they can spoil the integrity uh, of a product that's, of the sensitive products and, and nature of the products that are being um, completed within the clean room. So here's just a time-lapse video to give you an idea of, of a, a more permanent clean room. So the, the modular clean rooms don't really offer the, the thermal integrity or the control in terms of temperature or, or relative humidity and all the other environmental controls that you want to take into account. And um, 
depending on the volume of air that's required, you know, for example, if you're building uh, uh, satellites, you, you need a, a huge space and that requires a huge volume of, of air to get the air changes and, and the huge filters. So in that case, you wouldn't really be uh, installing the ducting on the ceiling. It would be more in a, in a separate room. Um, the ducting is, is connected to your HEPA filters, which are in the ceiling, and those HEPA filters then directly supply into the air, creating more of a dispersed air um, airflow, which then circulates around the room. And depending on, once again, your classification, you can get up to 150 air changes per hour or 25 air changes per hour. The cost of creating that air, you'll see if I just pause the video here, um, the cost of creating the air and, and putting it for the, through the filtration, it becomes more and more expensive um, the higher the grade, you know, if you need an ISO 5 or, or laminar flow. So ideally you're looking at recirculating the air, which would happen a lot um, in the space station, you know, there's a lot of recirculation of air and filtering as well, which is actually why I did the funnel, because I think it's just such a fundamental uh, component to, you know, creating velocities and, and pressure and really um, it's, it's guaranteed to be used in whatever sort of engineering mechanics you're looking at, at, at creating. So the airflow comes from the, the top of the ceiling and then it's drawn down through these return, uh, return air grills um, and that's then pushed back into the system and there's a certain amount of, um, of fresh air intake that goes with the room. Clean rooms are typically very easily cleanable. You don't want any surface where particles can accumulate and uh, you want to keep those, of those particles to a minimum. Um, you know, I mentioned sort of when the modules were, were left to go into space, they were absolutely pristine because it's, it's very important, as I understand, to control the biosphere within the, the space station and the particles, bacteria, um, fungus and, and virus that exists between there. You know, as you go through deep and deep in space, what is that evolution? Um, what's going to happen with that evolution? Um, so... PPE is, is also manufactured within a clean room. I mean, I know ILC Dover have one of the biggest clean rooms um, in the UK. And um, they, they would then, oh, sorry about that. Let's go to the next slide. They would also have, you know, large spaces, um, easily cleaned, a certain protocol going into the clean room to make sure that there are no sort of contaminations. It's not necessarily the case for everyone, you know, a, a company in Turkey who's manufacturing PPE have all their necessary extraction, which you would need because a lot of dust particles are, are um, generated from, from, you know, creating manufacturing masks. And then they've also got the supply air to keep the balance going. However, if you're going to be manufacturing in the UK, you need to, to manufacture under a clean environment um, where you don't have, you know, you're free from surfaces, uh, uh, horizontal surfaces where you can get uh, fungus accumulating. Uh, once your clean room, so once you've gone through, you know, your your, uh, your donning process and you've got into the clean room, it needs to, the clean room's only a clean room if it performs to its specifications. And those are based on your particle, your particle sizes, the number of particles within the air um, at that sort of time, your, your airflow velocity and your air changes, as I mentioned. So those are, your particles are, are tested through an aerosol particle counter, which works on light light scattering principles, which allows the user um, sort of to gain instantaneous samples of air, which give an illustration of the loading of particles within that room. And then according to those uh, records, it would then provide the necessary ISO standard that you require to be, to be achieved. Um, not only do you get sort of the ISO 7s uh, environment and that's it. So if you're going into a more sort of sophisticated facility like the pharma giants and you're working to, to GMP, uh, you've got to have grade D, grade C, and as you go sort of deeper into the clean room, you, you get a higher grade. And those can be achieved using cabinets as well. So here we've got the biological safety cabinets, which offers user protection as well as operator, um, forgive me, operator protection 
as well as product protection. So you get the air barrier down the front of the cabinet and that's an ISO 5 environment because it's a unidirectional flow over the work surface. Then we've also got the laminar flow cabinet, which focuses more on the product protection. It creates up to an ISO 4 um, clean air environment that just either flows horizontally down or vertically across um, the work surface. And Thank you. Uh, I yeah, you're welcome. You. Yeah. And then just once you've left the clean room, you've got to go into the doffing process, um, where, which is also under strict protocol, uh, depending on where you are uh, within the lab and what lab you're doing, you know, what, taking off one layer of gloves, washing, and, and that's the clean room really just helps the airflow with contamination. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Julia. I think the, um, the clean room discussion is really interesting in that um, I wonder if that very same standard applies in the spacesuit. Do you have standards in the spacesuit for, um, for airflow and, and the like, or like how do you kind of control that biosphere? Um, yeah, and the operating environment of, of the spacesuit, how do you control that? So is, that is that question for me? I guess. Yeah, or like um, if, if Rick can yeah. chip in as well. Um, so the um, the air that's uh, that's circulated inside of a uh, an EVA spacesuit um, is uh, predominantly uh, oxygen. So it's uh, it's not like the uh, the air that we breathe here on Earth, uh, or the air they breathe on the inside of the International Space Station when they're um, in the in the space station. Um, that that air is uh, is a nitrogen oxygen mix. Uh, so typically somewhere around 21% oxygen um, and 78% uh, nitrogen and then a bunch of other trace gases. Um, so that's what we breathe here on Earth. What they breathe inside the spacesuit is, it starts as pure oxygen, but of course as you're exhaling, um, every breath you exhale has a lot of carbon dioxide and water vapor in it. So the inside of the suit ends up being a mix of um, high concentration of oxygen with uh, uh, with then lower concentrations of uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, so that it's uh, um, it's sort of uh, uh, the way you would think of it maybe is is bottled purified air. So um, so before it ever gets to the International Space Station, um, going up on a rocket, it's uh, it's purified here on Earth. Uh, that air that then gets uh, put into the uh, the life support um, system. Uh, that's in the backpack on the uh, on the back of the EMU, um, and uh, that's um, actually a little little tidbit about that. That's uh, um, I alluded to earlier. This uh, this term pre breathe. Um, one of the reasons that they have to do that, or the main reason they have to do that, is they have to purge the oxygen or the nitrogen from their blood, and so that takes several hours of breathing pure oxygen to get the nitrogen out of your blood because the, the pressure inside the, uh, inside the spacesuits is much reduced versus the pressure that they see inside the International Space Station or that we'd see here at sea level on Earth. Um, and it's the same effect that can, uh, uh, can cause um, what deep sea divers would call the bend. It's that same effect where the nitrogen um, in that reduced pressure starts, um, starts um, uh, uh, coming out of your blood in bubbles and can cause uh, big medical problems. Um, so that's why they have to do that pre-breeze thing is, uh, is to get the nitrogen, purge the nitrogen out of their blood um, so they can breathe this uh, more highly concentrated oxygen environment, but at a re much reduced pressure. So I could go into the physics of partial pressures and all that stuff, but that's probably beyond the, uh, the scope of this talk. <laughs> Probably we can bring Rick in is a very good uh, point to bring Rick in on um, sort of the experience of breathing these kind of purified air and the experience of, of going through the space. So there's a lot of questions around uh, your experience in space, so how does certain things feel, how does cloth feel, how does thermal regulation feel, uh, how does it smell. Um, maybe here we can talk about also sort of how how does breathing this kind of air feel? How does breathing air feels in in space? Different? How do, how do, how does it differ from from Earth? Okay, well, um, breathing at a much reduced uh, pressure, as Dan just talked about, uh, 
it's noticeable at first. So, okay, let me let me backtrack too. He talked about the International Space Station uh, being an STP, standard temperature pressure, um, which is kind of like you know what it would be at sea level here for us. We're, we're close, similar. Um, on some old shuttle missions, we used to decrease the pressure before an EVA down to 10.2. So we'd actually decrease the pressure in the cabin for the whole crew, and then we bleed out, so to speak, help with some of the, getting rid of some of the nitrogen, um, bringing the pressure down. And then uh, the people who are gonna do the spacewalk will get in their suits and do another deep press. Uh, on the International Space Station, uh, what we do is, well, there are several different methods. There, there was an exercise method where we would actually have intense exercise for a while that would help drive the nitrogen out of our system and then we also had something called a camp out where the EVA crew would get into the space, uh, the airlock, the crew lock, and actually decrease pressure overnight uh, and purge nitrogen that way. Uh, and also, you know, uh, with increasing oxygen concentrations until we got it in the suit. But ultimately when you're on the space station, you're going from an STP, you know, standard temperature pressure down to about 4.3 relative in the suit. So there's a, there's a big difference in pressure there. Um, and one of the best ways, uh, you know, uh, to, to really realize that you're down that low of a pressure is trying to whistle in the suit. Or when you talk or make uh, strange noises, you sound really tinny. Uh, your voice changes, timber. Uh, you know, when you're doing calm, uh, you can listen to people on calm in the suits and they don't sound like they used to, that, that they sounded like inside in a normal pressure environment. And that's because, you know, your vocal cords aren't working the same way in a, in a low pressure environment, so to speak, in terms of how they make noise. And uh, when you say, try and whistle, which someone told me to do, they said, hey, you know, try and whistle now that you're in a spacesuit. And you'll start trying and it's like, whoo, and you just, you can't do it. I mean, there's not enough air pressure actually to form that, to form the whistle and make a noise. So. It's all kind of a, it's, it's a different kind of world out there. It's all very interesting. And, you know, you're, it's like uh, Dan said, it's like physics at, physics at work, physics at play. You know, you're actually experiencing this stuff you learned in high school and college about partial pressures. And, you know, if you're a diver, the bends and all this stuff comes into play when you're doing an EVA. Uh, and you don't want to, you don't want to cut corners to do something wrong because, uh, you know, that could cause big problems. It could cause big problems medically for the person in the suit and maybe even big problems for the suit itself if you don't do things right. Well, it's fascinating to hear that you can actually do things wrong for the suit. <laughs> um, most people think about, oh, things would go wrong for the person, but there is obviously a thing that could go wrong for the suit. There's quite a bit of question around like redundancy, like how do you, Built redund how much redundancy is built in, in the event of failure of primary system. Um, do you have any sort of comments on it um, for, for actually to all panelists, like how do we build redundancy into our suit and our environment, operating environment? I think that would be uh, best suited to answer that question. Okay, um, so that um, Rick during his talk alluded to the numerous layers that are in the suit. Um, and depending on how you count layers, that uh, the, the layer count uh, can can vary quite a bit, um, because some of the materials that we acquire to put into the suit are in and of themselves composites. So you know, kind of the number of layers that we build into the suit is a little bit different than the total number of layers of suit if you go all the way back far enough back in sort of the manufacturing process. But the way the way to simplify the whole thing is. Um, Suits basically have three um, kind of uh, composite layers to them. There's the inner layer that uh, that we call the bladder. That's the that's the layer that um, that maintains the pressure. Um, outside of that is a layer that's called the restraint layer, and that keeps that uh, bladder layer, which is pressurized, because as Rick said, uh, the suits um, during an EVA are running at 4.3 psi. Um, which sounds low when you compare it to 14.7 PSI, which is standard temperature and pressure here on Earth. But 
out in low Earth orbit and beyond, the pressure is effectively zero on the outside, zero absolute. So you've got a 4.3 PSI pressing, pressing against zero PSI. So the suit tries to balloon as a result of that. So there's a restraint layer that keeps, the, uh, that, keeps that bladder layer from ballooning. And then outside of that is what we call the TMG, the thermal, thermal micrometeoroid garment. So that's the outer layer that, um, and that's made of some pretty exotic fibers um, that are pretty closely related to, um, to Kevlar. So you can think of that outer, that they're actually stronger than Kevlar. Um, and uh, you can think of that whole outer layer as kind of a bulletproof garment um, to protect against these micrometeoroid impacts. Um, and it's also a, a thermal layer. The reason that the suits are always white um, is because when the nerve um, is Rick alluded to, for 45 minutes they're on the light side of the Earth, and for 45 minutes they're on the dark side of the Earth as they're doing an EVA. So every, um, every 90 minutes the International Space Station does a complete orbit, but for 45 minutes it's on the light side of the Earth. And during that time, um, because you don't have an atmosphere to help filter and, and buffer the temperature change, the temperature on that side is incredibly high. It's somewhere around plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so, um, so that's the temperature that here on Earth, that uh, standard temperature and pressure would, uh, would more than boil water. Um, so um, that white layer um, is a reflective layer that tries to reflect as much of that, uh, um, that radiation as possible. So that's kind of the, the, the short answer. Um, the uh, maybe a little more in-depth answer to that specific question is that um, the, the suits actually do leak slightly. Um, everything leaks, um, which is a hard concept for some people to, uh, to grasp. But uh, there's sufficient um, pressure in the, um, in the air that's in the, uh, in the oxygen that's in the, the um, life support backpack that, um, that it can overcome those slight leaks. So even if it were, even if um, there were to be a small puncture in those, uh, there's sufficient air pressure and, uh, and redundancy in that system to give the astronaut time to get back through um, the airlock and back to safety inside the International Space Station. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Um, and Julia, do you have anything to add with redundancy in clean room situations? I think there is that a certain degree of built-in redundancy, but it's because of the functionality of the clean room in that filters do get blinded. You know, your HEPA filters are there to create the environment and trap all the, the particles that are going through. But once that becomes saturated or blinded, as they call, uh, that filter then needs to be disposed of, in, depending on what's going in and out of the room, um, within sort of dictate of how that is to be expo uh, disposed. So in that regard, uh, there is that, that redundancy uh, that has to, you know, you have to replace it and, and you can't reuse it and, and all of those types of things. So that's where I would say it comes into play with the clean rooms. Thank you. Um, thank you. We're, we're three minutes uh, towards the end, towards the close. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, I think there are still lots of questions that is unanswered. I think some of them we will answer next time because a lot of them on uh, the sort of layers and the kind of protection, redundancy, that probably will pop up again next time in the next session, which is the protective clothing session layer up, which is on the 17th of September. Um, and join us on the 17th of September. I think Nikita is gonna post the link in chat uh, so that you can continue to ask those questions. Your question today is not lost. We will actually take them in and review some of them and maybe feed them forward into our next discussions. Uh, for example, also someone asked about VR. Uh, we will put that into our last session, which is about adaptive clothing. Um, so do join us on that one as well. Um, and then I think there is some more comments around uh, Dava and Dava Newman and SpaceX's slim suit, something we should uh, comment on at some point. Um, but yeah, I think our time is running very short and I would like to thank our panelists, Dan, Rick 
and Julia for joining us today and yourselves for being here and asking questions. Um, so yeah, um, uh, see you next time. Um, thank you.